Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for coming. I'm Margaret Mantor. I work in the CESA program in the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch. And um, this is one of a series of lectures that we're going to be hosting on species-specific issues. For those of you that are participating through WebEx, you are on mute on the conference line, but you can send questions by typing them in on WebEx, and we will get them to the speaker. Um, I also wanted to mention that we're giving credit through OTD for attending the lecture, so please make sure that you sign in if you're in the room, and if you're participating remotely, make sure that you let me know that you signed in, um, and I can send you a sign-in sheet if I haven't already. Our next lecture is going to be on giant garter snakes, and that's going to be next week on the 30th. Um, so if you haven't gotten the flyer, please let me know, and I can give you the information about that. And um, we're going to have Ryan Mathis introducing our speaker, so I'll turn it over. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ryan Mathis with the Habitat Conservation Planning Branch, and it's my pleasure to introduce Murad this afternoon. I've known Murad for almost 20 years now, so I could just freestyle this, uh, this bio, but I'm going to read what he has down. Uh, Murad is a wildlife disease ecologist whose research focus is to investigate and understand the threats to wildlife of conservation concern from both infectious and non-infectious agents. He completed both of his degrees, undergrad and grad, at Humboldt State, uh, focusing on wildlife ecology and the diseases that affect the wildlife populations. After grad school, he co-founded Integral Ecology Research Center, which is a nonprofit scientific research, uh, research organization where he is the senior ecologist and executive director. In addition to leading several interdisciplinary national and international <laughs> research projects through this organization, Murad has authored several scientific publications, book chapters focusing on infectious and non-infectious diseases. Uh, he's, he will be completing his PhD at UC Davis uh, this November uh, in the uh, UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine focusing on disease threats to California wildlife. He resides in Northern California where he and his wife, who is also an ecologist, try to spend as much time as possible outdoors and enjoying our public lands. And what Murad does not have down here is that he testified on this issue before the United States Congress in Washington, D.C., and has collaborated with Congressman Jared Huffman on some legislation, House Bill 2735, if you're interested. And most recently, he was interviewed by Dan Rather. So with that, I will turn it over to Murad. All right. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so, be sure not to say... Okay, um, well, thank you everybody for coming out for uh, this talk, and I think it's a very relevant talk uh, that pertains to many of us, and, and it's in the nuances that um, they are integrated within our natural resources. And the, and the title of this talk, Is the Grass Really Green? And the Conservation Peril from Illegal Marijuana Cultivation in California, and I'm going to be discussing the current knowledge as well as a lot of unanswered questions. And the reason why is the grass really green? Because I, I feel that the public, as well as uh, various agencies and academia, uh, haven't fully uh, been informed and educated on this matter, and I think we're just starting to scratch on the surface on uh, the environmental degradation that's occurring. With that is... Uh, If I can get an advance on the next slide. It looks like it's actually... Or it actually, maybe it's not on the... Uh, there it is. Perfect. Thank you so much, Margaret. So what this talk will not cover is actually, uh, I mean, what this talk will cover is actually the current data we have on the issue uh, and also the potential impacts to forest communities uh, and also barriers in addressing this uh, issue and also pot uh, potential solutions and future directions. But 
what this talk will not cover is the ethical and morality issues of marijuana, medicinal uh, qualities or policy and legal concerns. And the reason why is because it becomes emotionally charged and I think the science that we're developing and as well as many other collaborators are developing uh, is sufficient enough to stand on itself without uh, bringing in a potential emotional context that may cloud the surface. So again, the collaborative efforts that we have on this, and um, I'm, I'm bringing in multiple projects, and the collaborative efforts that we have is an interdisciplinary approach. And what I mean by this is utilizing expertise from so many different facets in our field that we can um, utilize in order to address the situation. And so that's working with federal, state, academia, NGOs, and it develops an out-of-the-box approach because as many of you know, when you become entwined on a specific uh, matter, you may have blinders on and you're focusing on one thing, but bringing somebody outside of your agency, bringing somebody outside of your expertise or another agency helps um, spread that light a little bit so it can illuminate a little bit further. But again, this is not just the two agency or the entities that I represent. These are all the collaborators that we have that are um, bringing this data for this talk forward. So you can see there's a wide spectrum from federal, state, NGOs, as well as uh, private entities that we're working with. Now, the background, the focal species, um, the flagship or the umbrella species that has uh, brought this to light has been the fisher. And the fisher, or the Pacific fisher, in 2004, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service ruled that the fisher uh, was warranted for listing uh, under the Endangered Species Act, and that's currently also being under review uh, for state listing as well. Now, the next question a lot of folks ask me is, what is a fisher? I know many of you folks are aware of it, but there's also a lot of, a fisher is actually does not really fish. That's not like a kingfisher, it's actually a mammal. And with that, it's, um, it's a forest specialist uh, mid-sized carnivore. Uh, so the habitat is mid to late serial stage forest, and it's continuous forest. So a fisher is not like a cosmopolitan species like a gray fox, a mountain lion, or coyote where it's going to be on edge habitat um, in urban settings. These are backcountry settings, wilderness settings. So if you think of habitat that northern spotted owls inhabit, that's typically the type of habitat the fishers uh, utilize as well. And the diet is it's an omnivore. Even though it's a carnivore, but it's really an omnivorous carnivore, it consumes a whole wide spectrum of different prey items, um, so rodents, lagomorphs, so ro uh, rabbits, uh, but it also consumes carrion, so dead animals, and berries. So when we go ahead and do these knee crops and we find stomach contents, these, these fishers actually have manzanita berries, they have acorns, uh, we'll find lichens and fungi. So they're really uh, wide diverse in their breadth of uh, diet. And then males, so there's a sexual dimorphism, which means males are a little bit larger than females. Um, and the reproduction, and this is going to be key for some of the data I'll be presenting. So the reproduction is um, they, they mate in uh, basically March, April, but they'll raise their young uh, when they give birth around March and April as, as well, um, all the way up to September. So keep in mind this time period it is really crucial when we start integrating this to the time period or the temporal points where people are out there cultivating marijuana. And the range in California currently are two isolated populations. Again, fishers were believed, and the reason why they're being uh, uh, reviewed for and merit listing for the Endangered Species Act as well as for the State uh, uh, Endangered Species Act is because of two main factors that believe to be uh, perpetuated their, their local extinction in a lot of their uh, historic range, which is pelts. So a lot of uh, folks are familiar with sables, uh, sable coats. They're, re they're related. They're another species of uh, martis that are related to uh, fishers. And they're priced for their pelts. And so a fisher, coat, a fisher pelt can go up to several hundred dollars. So if you think about it, folks can go out there and make a living with just one season of fisher trapping. Um, so that was one of the, the main items, as well as the fragmentation of habitat. So these are good examples of what um, habitat fishers are not preferred towards because of the edging, the edge effects 
with this fragmentation. So kind of to illustrate how far fishers have, or how much of their historic range has contracted, um, this gray area, if you can see in the slide, this gray area is basically the historic range where fishers resided. Um, they've contracted where the hatch marks are essentially the two isolated populations, so the Northern California and the Southern Sierra populations. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a context of how big these populations are, the Southern Sierra Nevada populations are believed to be less than 250 individuals to no more than 120 adults. That's one of the population estimates. Uh, the Northern California population, though, it's unknown what the estimate uh, population is because there's just little monitoring that's occurring beyond um, a small portion of Northwest California. But again, the percentage of contraction that's happened for this population is that from the historical range, and this is a very, very actually liberal estimate of the ranges, but the historical range is uh, believed to be to, uh, currently fishers are occupying only 18 to 21 percent of their historical range within the state of California. So that's, that's a huge decrease. And the disjunct uh, populations also leaves room that if anything comes through, there's not this continuous source of potential other animals that may be contributing to, let's say, a population decline here, this Northern California population won't be able to contribute towards that. Again, this is deep fisher habitat. This is where there's actually uh, probably about, if in this view, four to five fishers occupy this range. This is the habitat, what I'm talking about. That is typical continuous forest that fishers uh, prefer. Now, for this, I kind of wanted to illustrate that folks are unfamiliar with what a fissure is or what it looks like. That is a fissure actually on a resting site in northwestern California. Let's get this. And this is a video that will. And that's basically a fissure. Uh, you'll see how agile they are. This is a female fisher coming out of her den site. So you see these little holes, these decadent trees that they prefer. And this is about 60 to 70 feet above the ground. You can see how agile she is. She can just shake. And so that's basically a behavior characteristic, but also that illustrates also the types of trees that fishers prefer. Uh, for denning. So there's these decadent trees that have cavities where they can raise their kids. Now, the next question is, how the heck did we were able to link fishers to marijuana cultivation sites? And to bring this, to illustrate this, is we have fishers that are monitored. And they're long-term uh, research monitoring projects. And with that, you have a dead fisher, but in order to get that dead fisher to, to find out where it is, it, we go ahead and um, instill these long-term demographic monitoring projects. And so you have what you have up here in this top corner is a capture of the fisher. We take the relevant biological samples. We go ahead and put a VHF or a GPS collar on these individuals, monitor them through the landscape. And then when they have a mortality signal, which is a signal that if the collar becomes inactive, it, it pulses out a different cadence uh, of the pulse. And that cadence will indicate that the fissure has either not moved or it's dead. And then you would go in, find that fissure, and we also do a necropsy. And if the necropsy, that's the one key thing, is the necropsy is done by board-certified pathologists and toxicologists. And the key point of that is that we're just not doing a cursory gross necropsy and go, looks like it got hit by a car or it looks like it got killed by a predator, we're looking at every particular um, clinical manifestation that may have ma uh, resulted in that cause of the death of that animal. And then finally, we take all the tissue and do all the ancillary diagnostic testing. The one thing I'd like to point out is that just the cursory projects, like just going out there, possibly monitoring these animals for one year or without the long-term demographic monitoring, none of the data we've, we have or could have generated could have been done without long-term monitoring. That's the key essential point. We continue this monitoring throughout the years. But again, we, like I mentioned, we do ancillary testing, which includes 
anticoagulant rodenticide testing. So the next question is, what is anticoagulant rodenticide? And essentially, it's a chemical pesticide. It comes in various uh, forms. So there's pellets, bait blocks. Uh, this is this is rodificum. It's a type of rodenticide. But you see, there's the pellet form, the bait block form, and it has flavorizers. And essentially, what it does is inhibits the vitamin K recycling. I won't go into the details of that, but mammals, we recycle our vitamin K that leads to various clotting factors. So therefore, if we have an injury, um, we can actually clot that injury so we don't exsanguinate or bleed out. But what happens is, is if you have this vitamin K being inhibited and you consume all this rodenticide, you basically leak out. This is what is considered a very painful death. So you can either, any injury, you just will bleed to death or if you have no injury, your vessels, your blood vessels basically become cysts and you just leak into your cavities. You just leak, leak, leak until you finally are dead. But really key thing here is the flavorizers. So these AR compounds are bitter and unpalatable. The problem with this is that these manufacturers get the okay by EPA to go ahead and put these flavorizer emulsions in them. And these flavorizer emulsions are, and, and I, can, can, I can basically state that I see these on the market and I see these also out in the field. There's flavorizers that have peanut butter, apple, cheese, bacon. There's even one that has bacon and cheese. And just recently, I just added this, we just went to a grow site. I went and checked on the manufacturer's website. We went to a grow site where we found rodenticide that was fish and another one that was meat flavored, but then that manufacturer can also create that rodenticide that is chocolate flavored. So we, we need to start thinking about with these flavorizers that are being impregnated into these, uh, these, these compounds, is we run the risk of primary poisoning. So that's now, like for here, as example, is the humble Martin, but we run a risk of a carnivore species coming in and consuming. There's no doubt that if you leave a flavorizer that smells like fish or meat, a carnivore is going to consume that. Now you also run the risk of secondary poisoning because, which would be this carnivore consuming a flying squirrel that has consumed a rodenticide that tastes like apple or peanut butter. So now you open up the gamut of various mechanisms of poisoning because of these flavorizers. So with that, and I won't, um, a lot of folks are familiar with our PLOS paper, but I want to illustrate through the mechanism how we started generating this data in our in our um, timeline is the PLOS paper essentially, we looked at exposure to rodenticides and we only focused on trespass growth. So these are growths that are on our public, tribal, or community land where it would be illegal to cultivate. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, tomatoes, pineapples, it doesn't matter. Uh, marijuana, to cultivate on these lands without the public agency, steward's permission, or the public's permission. So we found that this cultivation was occurring and we found um, essentially 80% of the fishes that we tested were exposed to one or more rodenticides. Um, just to illustrate, we had an average of about two rodenticides per fisher, and in this paper, we had in the fishers that were exposed to four different rodenticides. We also found four mortalities that were due to this poisoning, so we had directly, we showed direct effects to a fisher individual that they died from rodenticide poisoning. And in our spatial modeling, when we started to look, we wanted to look at clusters. We wanted to see if there were fishers being exposed more on the peripheral edges, kind of close to towns or roads. Maybe someone did a legal dump, but what we found was it was ubiquitous throughout the system. It didn't matter where fishers were in our study areas, they were, they were going to be exposed or they had the high likelihood of being exposed. This is also a really key point we found. We had a neonatal or milk transfer of a rodenticide to a fisher kit. This is a nutritional fisher kit, so it was completely dependent on mother's milk. That kit was exposed to a second generation anticoagulant rodenticide, and that's the highly acute generation of rodenticides, so the super poisons, they call it. Um, so now you have a fisher kit that is starting either transplacentally within the mother's womb or starting just in birth, being exposed to this rodenticide, which means that whenever it consumes prey items or comes across as toxicant in the future, it's just going to bioaccumulate in that system. So it's already starting on a negative foot. 
So that was a really surprising find. Kind of further illustrating the spatial, this is worth the paper, is the spatial distribution of our exposure rates, as you can see here, it didn't matter where you were. The reds were the mortalities, the, the yellows were actually the exposed individuals, and the green, where you look here, you've only got these two individuals and you only have a couple individuals in the lower polygon, but those are the ones that weren't exposed. We had four individuals Based off of their collars, they lived their entire lives in Yosemite National Park, and they were exposed to rodenticide. We had individuals here that this is where they got, where they were, they were caught, but they're basically, their whole range was in a wilderness roadless setting. They, were, they just happened to be on the peripheral edge of this, this project area, but they lived their entire lives pretty much in a roadless wilderness setting, but they were still being exposed. So what were the sources of this exposure? You know, we didn't show that it was close to Oakhurst or Fresno, which wasn't the case. These are far, these are really far away, and this wouldn't be a uh, likelihood anyways. So after the PLOS paper, we started discussing with folks, and we started working with law enforcement, and law enforcement started stating, hey, we've been seeing this stuff, and we're really happy that someone's starting to look at this. Should we show you guys what we've been seeing? And so we, when we went out to these growth sites, what we saw was just absolutely surprising and it blew our minds away. This is, these green pellets, are, the white pellets are fertilizer, the green pellets are second generation anticoagulant rodenticide. They place them at the bottom of the plant. There's 2,000 plants in this growth site. Each one of these plants had probably about a quarter of a cup or a half a cup of rodenticide. We went to a site where there was a documentation of 90 pounds of unspent second generation anticoagulant rodenticide. And we found numerous pounds of already opened and eaten packages. It's, you know, when we, now when we go to growth sites, it's actually pretty sad when we go to a growth site and I only find 10 or 15 pounds and it's, it doesn't faze me. I look at it, that's a normal site. You know, I'm surprised if I find a site that's over 50 pounds. But anything below 50 pounds, it's just normal. That's what's go going on out there. Now, we also started finding not just rodenticide, we started finding, and this is just one site. Again, this is only 20 pounds of rodenticide. That's just typical, and this is unspent. These are completely unopened packages waiting for a predator or a rodent to come in there and eat it. But what we started finding, and this is a, um, a collaborator of mine, Mark Higley, what we found on this site, he's got a full respirator there, and the reason why is this right here is carbofuran or furidan. These bottles are sitting out in 95 degree heat. These are five gallon sprayers full of carbofuran uh, and furidan. And the, the problem with this, carbamate, it's a banned carbamate. It's not legal for use in North America. And the problem with this is that here you are in this hot environment. These things can vent at any second. And if he doesn't have that respirator on and that venting happens, he'll die. We can't touch this because if you touch this without the proper PPE, the transdermal uh, potency, it can, it, it can cause lethality. So now we have in these banned chemicals out there, DDT, carbamates that are banned, and restricted use chemicals. So you know, finding 10 or 15, 20 different chemicals is, uh, it, it's common. You know, we, we are surprised when we find 30 chemicals or more at one site, and that's only one site. Fragmented landscapes. Very common practice. You can see right here, um, actually probably in the top screen was a little bit better, but this is brush. It's about an eight foot wall of brush that's piled up. That's the ground right there is, is pretty much mid to late cereal stage forest. They cut a lot of the, the trees down and these little patches they've cleared out. They rake the ground to the rock. There's no material there. And that's, that's a fragmented landscape, but that's also a landscape that's not gonna allow other trees to seed in there. But that's, you know, and also it's an impediment for wildlife, that these barriers of just six to eight foot barriers of brush material that these guys do. Now, the other thing is we find water diversions and toxic, toxic field slurry ponds. So this is um, one water cistern. I would say it's probably about um, three by four meters 
that's the, uh, the, 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 the range of this one water cistern. You can see the water that's spilling out of here. It's a bluish tint. The reason why it's a bluish, bluish tint is because what they do into these water cisterns, they open up 50-pound bags of fertilizer, and there is probably about maybe 100 to 150 pounds of fertilizer, soluble fertilizer that's placed in here. Because what they do is they tap into these water cisterns with irrigation lines to go run uh, to their plants. But these cisterns are leaking, and there's a creek underneath here. So what is all of this highly nitrogen-fixed water doing, pouring into our waters and creek sheds? And in fact, this water cistern right below this is a creek that feeds as a tributary to um, endangered coho salmon. But this particular site, they had 15 different cisterns out there. So, and there was one cistern that there was actually a, a series of three cisterns where above the cisterns were alders, equisetum, so these, uh, this riparian-dominated uh, uh, um, vegetative material, and below it was completely dead. It was like a dead corridor. It dried up the creek. And so whatever aquatic invertebrates were there are no longer able to have that due to the habitat being uh, taken away. So building up on this, uh, we started looking at, and another publication we came out was, the first one was looking, the PLOS paper was looking at the impacts to an individual. We wanted to find out what were the impacts potentially to a population level. So we wanted to figure that out, and with that, this is in the Southern Sierra, what we were able to determine is that the average number of marijuana grow sites for a female fisher's home range was 5.3. So that means in the Southern Sierra, a female fisher's home range, which is about 1,000 hectares, it's not really that large, was an average of five different trespass grows in her range. Now, when we looked at females that were exposed versus females that weren't exposed, the average number of sites for an exposed fisher was four sites. It was less than one for fishers, female fishers that were not exposed. The other key thing to point here is the range. The range of female fishers being exposed to this rodenticide was 1 to 16. There were fishers that had 16 different trespass growth sites within their home range. But the range for non-exposed was 0 to 1. So there's a clear correlation we were able to make in this paper that exposure was now correlated with growth sites. And then the next item was that we found that marijuana growth sites influence female sur fisher survival rates. So that means then that these now, these growth sites are impacting fishers, not just as an individual, but as a population level. That's a significant find. So now the new emerging data we're starting to develop is that we have three more fisher deaths. So remember the four that we, pay, uh, we, we did in the PLOS paper, we added three more fisher deaths, so now we have a total of seven. And then the fisher exposure rate in that paper was 80%, but now when we combine it, we're about 86% of fishers being exposed. Now, this is actually, um, I don't know if folks have here heard about the hot dog fisher. Uh, the hot dog fisher, was again is that is that working is that integral collaboration we were able to do with law enforcement when we went into a site and law enforcement was able to radio back to us and say, hey, I think we have a fisher here. When we went and checked out that fisher, um, you know, first of all we were thinking, well, is it, are, you, are were they sure of the fisher? Uh, we'll we'll see what happens. And here it is. We found this fisher just on the ground on the floor. The site, you know, we keep on thinking. These trespass grows, the ones that are going to be really impactful are going to be these trespass grows that are 1,000, 2,000, 20,000, 30,000 plants. This fisher that died was at a trespass grow that was about 300 plants. So it's a small grow that's probably no big, bigger than this auditorium. But this fisher died from poisoning of a restricted use pesticide, which is called methamyl. It's a carbamate. It, was, it died because it consumed hot dogs, this, not this specifically hit this hot dog, but one of 13 hot dogs that were strung along this growth site that were on treble hooks. We cut, and this, this fisher essentially had the hot dog in its stomach contents, and the other crazy part about this was that the fisher still had the hot dog mid-esophagus met that, 
it died so acutely that it didn't even finish swallowing that last piece of hot dog. And then when we found it, there was still saliva and bubbles within um, on its muzzle, suggesting that it com it's probably a convulsive, very um, painful death, but also died very recently from where we found it. This is up in uh, Northern California. Um, it would be right between Orleans and uh, Willow Creek. So again, now we have this malicious poisoning that is intentionally used out there. The other thing is, too, law enforcement asked us when we found this, law enforcement asked us, what do we do with the hot dog? We didn't have the proper PPE at that site. We had to leave those hot dogs because technically when those hot dogs were so contaminated that if any of the law enforcement would have touched it or we would have touched it without the proper PPE, it could have made an individual sick or it could have even possibly killed somebody just due to the how methanol is, is rated the highest toxicity under EPA standards. So we went back out to the site a couple days later, and unfortunately, all those hot dogs were consumed. They were all gone, and then we found a dead gray fox, and then we also found, we also heard, de I mean, we smelled decomposition occurring in the area. But we couldn't find it, but the problem is, is we also had turkey vultures consuming, uh, flying out of that area. So anything that consumes, it's just that the cycle of death can occur at these sites. So, you know, again, we're, we're looking at rodenticide, but we're also looking at other chemicals that are maliciously placed out there intentionally to kill wildlife. We're now looking at spotted owls. We've tested two spotted owls. Both of those have been positive for rodenticide. And barred owls, we've tested 10. Um, half of them have been exposed to rodenticide. We have uh, another batch of 90 that we're testing, so we'll have about a 90 barred owls to test. Uh, but again, we can't, you know, we're, we're, we have the data on these guys to um, uh, do another study similar to the Fisher study, but again, uh, we can't really correlate this exposure to marijuana cultivation, but we all know these spotted owls and barred owls that were collected were collected behind closed gates where there's no public access, but there's trespass growth where uh, marijuana is being cultivated in association with rodenticide. So there's a strong correlation, but we're trying to hopefully at one point make that link and see if the exposure is correlated with that. Um, this slide actually is something really surprising, and it, it kind of blew a lot of us um, uh, uh, out of the water. We, we went ahead and decided to just look at a couple invertebrates. We looked at snails, grasshoppers, and millipedes. We took five pulled samples, so five grasshoppers, five millipedes and five snails, pulled them together, uh, kept the species intact within each, each group. And we're not talking about going into a growth site. We're talking about uh, in looking for a chemical pile. We just went to where there was plants that were eradicated and just started sampling the invertebrates. And these are live invertebrates. And when we started testing these individuals, we're talking all of them were positive for anticoagulant rodenticide. So the grasshoppers that were just hopping around in the forest floor nearby where marijuana was cultivated, same with the millipedes and the snails, were all positive for this rodenticide. They're not going to die from it because it doesn't inhibit the vitamin K, which they're not utilizing for coagulation uh, uh, factors. So there's no negative effects these guys are going to have. But the problem is, is this toxicant is being sequestered in their tissue now you're starting at the bottom of the food chain and the food web that invertebrates are going to be exposed. That opens up a huge game of different wild terrestrial and avian wildlife species and even aquatic species that are going to potentially be exposed to this. So let's just kind of a recap of a synopsis of what we know. We know that a rare terrestrial California carnivore, the fisher, is exposed to and poisoned from toxicants from marijuana growth sites. We know that these growth sites are now impacting a fisher's survival in a deleterious way. We also know that northern spotted and barred owls are exposed to AR. And then that inverts are exposed to AR and other toxicants, and they're still alive. But the next question is, is do we know how extensive this is in California? And this is a paper we published, and I also want to kind of um, a lot of the data that I'm going to present 
is um, was brought by a group of volunteers um, that have actually devoted so much of their time and actually uh, one of them has given up their, his life working towards this, and that's Shane Krogan. And these guys are just the epitome of stewards of our natural resources within the state. And I just want to kind of um, let folks know that, um, you know, these guys essentially had a fire that they, and they were able to pass that torch to so many different researchers that were so key and integral that we're going to continue their fire and, and spread basically that information out. And, and so what I, a lot of this data is dependent on their hard work that they've been doing volunteer-wise. And so when we're looking at their data as that Shane and uh, the High Sierra Volunteer Trails crew were able to generate is, there was, in 2005 to 2010, they reclamated 637 sites in only two of California's 17 national forests. So how extensive is this? I, I would say that's pretty extensive within our, our public lands. In addition to that, if you, if you were to go ahead and put um, the current range of where fishers reside in the Southern Sierras, it would perfectly, perfectly overlap this area. And it would be naive for us here to just think that what's happening in Sierra National Forest, the Sequoia National Forest, is only unique to those two fat forests, and that's Plumas National Forest, Six River, Shasta, Trinity, any of these national forests where it's basically sea level to 6,000 feet, it cannot be impacted. It would be very naive for us to think like that. So the next map is a map we're able to generate, and this is data that's specifically only trespass growth sites. We're not even talking about the 215 growth sites that could, are potentially impacting wildlife as well. So just for an example, I only have trespass growth sites for two years worth of data, and it's just over 1,000 uh, in California for this particular map. Just to kind of give an example of how extensive the 215s are is that it's, it's uh, believed that there's over 4,000 215 growth sites in just the county of Humboldt. So that's only 215 growth sites in one county, not Trinity or Mendocino or um, other counties, El Dorado County, where extensive 215 is growing. But these are trespass growth sites, and these are marijuana sites within the Fishers range. And so conservatively, it's stated that 40 to 60 percent of trespass growth sites are discovered. These guys are being very elusive in how they hide their, um, their cultivation sites. And also law enforcement doesn't have the resources to go in there and effectively remove every uh, site throughout all of our public lands. So let's just, what I'm displaying here is a very conservative estimate of what's occurring in Fisher's Range. You can see all of these sites is basically the, the dots represent the home range of a male fisher. So if we went ahead and put that this site can potentially impact one male fisher's home range, and we put that, you could see clearly that even if fishers were to expand out of the southern Sierra range, they're going to run into a wall of cultivation sites. Same thing goes along here and in northern California. But the other thing is, too, is to illustrate is that a lot of these sites are, if you look, are within highway corridors because that's, it's, um, it's a logistic and cost-effective way to eradicate these sites because it would be very difficult to go in the middle of the backwoods over here to try to eradicate sites that are far away from landing zones, far away from uh, other potential uh, uh, resources for law enforcement. But again, it, I, I hate to use the word naive, but it would be very naive for us to think that oh, these are clean areas um, because they're suitable habitat. There's water, southern exposed slopes, and it's under 6,000 feet. But again, if we went ahead into state, how, what we, I'm currently displaying in this map, how much is the potential impact of fishers? It has a, the, it has a potential impact of up to 38% of the current fishers range. So again, is, are these threats being seen at every, each and every site? And as a massive use of toxic and fragmented landscapes and water diversion seen? 
and it's unknown at this time. But what I can state is that the 20 plus sites that I've been able to visit in the last two years, I've seen each one of these in different magnitudes, but all, all three of these occurred at each one of the sites. Now again, let's just go back to that map and I'm just gonna go ahead and focus on just one little small area within uh, Six Rivers National Forest. This is the area that's 30 sites within only two years. This is 30 trespass sites in two years. This is um, Trinity River, the corridor. Everybody knows endangered species like coho are there. But this is also smack dab in the middle of spotted owl and fisher and even Humboldt Martin potential areas as well. So let's just focus on this one little site that I've been to. And then there, there's, there's actually a site in here. Um, one year was 100,000 plants. Um, several years ago was 30,000 plants, and this year was just eradicated with only just under 10,000 plants. But you can clearly see the site, right? It's fragmented and you can clearly see it. And what I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that they hide this stuff. It's a fragmented landscape, but if you go through Google Earth, you're gonna miss this. But that's the site. Those are the water courses, which are in blue, but the polygons is what the only polygons we're able to map. And I can only confidently say, state that I think that I've only been to about 40 to 50% of the site. Uh, there's so, the site is just extensive, and that's two days of research, me going on the ground with other crew members trying to document the site. But that's what it is, and I'm only going to focus on this kind of, this little polygon right here. So let's just look at that polygon, and I don't know if you guys can see it, but these are Christmas trees. These are marijuana plants that look like a Christmas tree farm. That's essentially what's going on out there. So when you look at this, and Google Earth took it in August, this is what that site looks like. You're going to miss that. It looks like it's, it's, habit, it's forested habitat, but it's not. In wintertime, that's gone. It's soil. It's just to bare rock. So the potential indirect impact, uh, effects from this, um, I'm going to start it off with a video. I want you guys to kind of grasp this video in order to, um, it's kind of going to help me illustrate the, the additional um, slides. That's a fisher right there, unanesthetized fisher. You're, you, you're, you can't be doing this with an unanesthetized fisher, just scruffing it and holding it by the tail. And the reason why Mark was able to do that is the taxia basically lethargy, the incoordination that's occurring with this fisher. We had to euthanize this fisher because there was absolutely no antidote that we could have given this fisher for whatever potential toxicosis um, due to a toxicant was occurring. And that fisher had four different anticoagulant rodenticides in its body. Um, but where the fisher resided, there was also nearby another type of rodenticide that's being used out there. There's a neurotoxin called bromethylene. And so we, and we tested for everything. It's just the fact that some of these toxicants are going to be almost undetectable in the tissue unless you can grasp it right there at that one second and it's still in its GI. But if it's consumed it and it's processed it and it's going through the clinical manifestations, but there's nothing in its gastrointestinal system, you're going to show up a negative, but it's, it's probably most likely a false negative. So highlighting, utilizing that, what the potential effects could happen to that fissure is, can these exacerbate or increase risk to conservation concerned species? And so we bring the question of predation on fissures. Is the previous thought for fissures is that, that um, predation only occurs on weak and vulnerable individuals. So therefore, only really old fishers are going to be killed by predators, or a fisher with a broken leg that's vulnerable is going to be uh, uh, susceptible to predation. Current data for California is showing that predation is the number one mortality factor. 58% of all mortality in bobcats are the number one predator for fishers. 
which is really surprising when on the East Coast, fishers kill lynxes, so, which are bigger than bobcats. And, but now we're having male fishers kill lynxes, but male fishers are being killed by felids such as bobcats. And so what is the potential mechanism for this? Now, why are we seeing such a high elevated rate or this hyperpredation that's occurring on fishers? So these are plausible scenarios. Uh, we're starting to look at this. Um, I don't want to think of you folks to think that it's actually been documented if this is the, the route and mechanism. These are just potential plausible scenarios, and I'm drawing parallels from other data that has been able to be documented. But again, these growth sites, and the red is a trail system, these are trail systems. And again, I've, I've only mapped 40 to 50% of this growth site. This growth site, these are old trails that are coming in. There's escape trails, there's, there's trails that are coming into water sources, trails that are coming down. I only stopped here, but this trail probably goes across the, the drainage. There's the growth site that continues here, but there's probably growth uh, trails everywhere. But you can see the extensive trail system here. And this is in, within continuous forest. And bobcats prefer edge. Bobcats will not go into this continuous forest. They'll stay up here in this edge habitat, this fragmented habitat or a road system. They should not be coming into this deep continuous forest. So now the question is, are, we, are these guys facilitating or co creating conduits for predators now to come into this continuous forest? It's unknown at this time, but you know, are these mechanisms for bobcats? These are, these are trail paths that these guys have worn down because they're utilizing these systems year after year and they're well-worn well trail paths. And we're deep into the forest. We're finding, you know, bear, bear scat's normal on these trails. But what we're finding is coyote, mountain lion, and bobcat scat deep in the forest on these trail systems. Where coyotes, would, you wouldn't think of a coyote being in the middle of that continuous forest or a bobcat. And we're finding their, their scat on these trails. So they're utilizing, we already know by documenting this, that they're, they're utilizing these trail systems, but can this potentially be a route or mechanism that leaves the fisher to be susceptible in an area where they shouldn't have that high risk of predation, but now these, are, these trail systems that these guys are doing are conduits for that. The next question is, could they, can we see expanded home ranges that encompass more prey opportunities? And they're expanding these home ranges because um, anticoagulant rodenticides are depleting prey populations, so therefore, in order to get the required nutritional support for growth and reproduction, they have to expand their home range to encompass more prey opportunities. And so could this potentially heighten interspecific or intergill predation uh, that's occurring on fishers? So, example, you have rodenticide reduce the prey population. You have only, instead of three gray squirrels, you have only one, and then now, now, are bobcats increasing their rates because they have to expand their home range? And I'm only focusing on the bobcats. So with that, this is typical um, home range for fishers and bobcats. So you have the uh, males are in the orange polygons, and males will not overlap. Males tend to butt up with each other, but females will overlap and intersect each other, and a male will have more than one female in his home range. But not, a, uh, but not another male fisher. Here's the edge habitat where bobcats will be living in. And, this is a, and here's another bobcat on this edge. Again, this is in the area where we had 30 sites in only two years. So again, can a scenario occur where now you have um, documented past studies where show that if prey decreases, Bobcat home ranges increases, and bobcat home range increase up to 200 to 500 percent. So now, if you have a prey decline or a sink area, can we see these bobcats now increase their home ranges? And this is only 200 percent increase in that uh, a polygon for a bobcat home range. So you can clearly see before where there was no interaction, just an increase of only 200 percent in a bobcat home range now encompasses multiple fissures. I'm only putting one variable in this. If you go ahead and increase fisher home ranges slightly, you're going to have multiple fishers now encountering, potentially encountering bobcats. These are all plausible scenarios that could happen, and I'm only basing this off of extrapolating from other data from other species, but it's a very likely scenario that uh, could be occurring 
It's just not being documented right now in our, in our uh, forest lands. So again, the other issue is the other indirect effects. Just in the state of California, from 2006 to 2011, we've lost 93, over 93,000 acres from fires that are grow site initiated. And this is the data I'm, I'm only able to pull out from public databases like CAL FIRE or InstaWeb, which is the U.S. Forest Service. But through that data, I'm able to, and going through all the fires, I'm able to only find numerous, several fires, but a total of 93,000 acres that are grow site initiated by marijuana cultivation. And these are trespass grows. We're not talking 215 uh, fires. We're talking trespass grows on public land that through their propane tanks or their stoves out in the middle of the forest. That's over $35 million in suppression costs. We're not even building up what the rehab costs could be occurring with just these fires. These fires, if I were to overlay the polygons on these fires and where the critical habitat that's lost uh, due to these fires, or, or occupied habitat, you can see fissures, marble murrelets, spotted owls, California condors. These are terrestrial species. I'm not even bringing up the invertebrates that have been impacted by these fires or the listed species of plants that are burned up in these fires. But again, illustrating that fires perpetuated by this cultivation out on public lands have, have uh, demonstrated already a, a millions of dollars and thousands of acres of loss. Now, what are the impacts of aquatic organisms within these watersheds? And the direct and indirect impacts have not been properly addressed. They, it's, just, it's just something that's starting to be looked at right now, but you just haven't been addressed about what all these chemical slurries, and what I mean by this is that what we're able to show on these trespass grows is an average of 2,000 pounds of high-grade fertilizer per site. And about 25 gallons, and this is the average, is 25 gallons of concentrated fertilizer per site. We find sites that have 1,000 pounds of 46% nitrogen fertilizer. And that's, just, that's an exorbitant amount of fertilizer to be placed out there, but it makes sense. When you look at that fragmented landscape, they're growing marijuana on rocks. So in order to have that type of cultivation, you have to utilize tons and tons of nutrients because the soil can't support that. But again, the new, numerous banned chemicals that are being placed out there is, we just, you know, what are these impacts? It's just unknown at this time. So further illustrating this is, you know, as I mentioned, that's the toxin placed into this water cistern. Here's a, a pickle barrel, 55-gallon pickle barrel. When you look at it in that um, uh, lower left-hand corner, you can clearly see that's just a slurry of unknown chemicals. Um, we're still analyzing that sample. But um, right, now, right nearby the pickle barrel was Avid. Um, uh, there was other miticides out there, uh, empty bottles, and about a couple hundred pounds of fertilizer bags. So, you know, this water could be not just fertilizer, but it can be pesticide laced as well. Um, these, these bags of fertilizer are right within a stream channel. So, again, the question is, is that all of this fertilizer, can this be depleting prey directly or also be reducing oxygen levels by this fertigation or this nitrific uh, nitrification that's occurring out there um, and therefore decreasing the oxygen loads in the watershed? That's, I mean, it's, very, it's been demonstrated in other um, avenues, but it's unknown if these sites, and remember, I'm just showing like a thousand trespass sites. We're not talking about the 215 sites, which also utilize a lot of these fertilizers. All of that in combination of synergy potentially exacerbating ox uh, and depleting oxygen levels. So again, the next question is these insecticides. Remember the invertebrates that were exposed to AR? We're talking at the bottom of a food web now that we now run the risk of these insecticides that are having no effect on on invertebrates, the half-life could be up to months at a time. And what I mean by months at a time is that it could be possibly a year before an insect depletes fully an anticoagulant rodenticide, just based off of its half-life. So not just terrestrial species, we're talking avian species, so swifts or bats. That's unknown. It's the contamination that could be occurring 
because of these open, fragmented landscapes in the middle of the forest are perfect foraging areas for these bats, perfect foraging areas for swallows and swifts, and all these insects that are coming up that may be toxic and laced, now providing food for these individuals and being that potential contamination source. Um, finally, this is the, the next uh, final slide is kind of going over the barriers of collecting data. It's dangerous. It's not, it's really, and what I mean by dangerous, it's dangerous because you can see here, these are nine individuals with 12 guns, with a poached female deer in our national uh, public lands uh, that are outside of, uh, uh, that have been cultivated in a growth site. That, and this is right in one of the Fisher Project areas. That right there is not a scene where you want to have your technician, your SIAD, walking out in the forest and encountering these individuals that have been out there for months at a time, already disregarding the law by poaching a deer and cultivating marijuana, you know, the safety of that individual being out there. Um, the toxicants and traps that I mentioned, it's not just the researchers, there's a law enforcement going out there. They're wearing their tactical uniforms that are cloth, or, and, and now you have the potential of absorption through that material underneath helicopters all these chemicals that could potentially pose risk to law enforcement officers that are actually out there protecting our public land. That's another risk that has not been fully ascertained. And then also the grants and resources are limited and this, this work is really expensive to conduct. So just to kind of illustrate further about the budget constraints, is this is just one Fisher project area. This one Fisher project they have to buy an extra vehicle, hire two other individuals, and extra supplies for those individuals because of safety. Now you can't just go out in the field and start monitoring a fisher. When I was monitoring fishers or other species with uh, VHF collars, I'd go out in the field for months at a time and without, you know, just call in in the morning, call in at, at night. Now you have to have two or more individuals constantly in radio contact. So with that, that's cost $48,000 per year for this one fisher project. And if, if incurred, the incurred cost currently is about a quarter of a million dollars, and it's ex expected to be a half a million to three quarters of a million dollars for the life of this project. Now, an extra cost simply because to initiate safety. And this is not safety reasons because they might run into a mountain lion or a bear, which is what we all thought we were going to run into the danger in the field. But now it's, we're talking about armed marijuana cultivators. And this is on public land. Again, the barrier to collecting data, going back to this map, this is 637 sites. There's 500 sites within this area that haven't been 100% reclamated because there's just a lack of funding. These sites are out there that pose a risk to the public, pose a risk to wildlife, and there's just not enough of a support mechanism out there to to fully recommend and provide the funding for the eradication, the documentation, and the reclamation of these, land, uh, these sites. And again, it's only estimated that 25 to 50 percent of these sites are 100 percent reclamated. So what I mean by 100 percent reclamated is piping removed, and similar to the reclamation, a good example was the reclamation that was occurring with Operation Pristine, where everything was removed. Piping, toxicants, um, campsites, and reclaiming that land. That's the type of reclamation that needs to occur. Um, some of the sites that have half the piping, half the toxicants, it needs to be fully removed out of there. So the solutions are, and these are solutions that um, not just myself, but mul multiple people have generated, is that we need to generate more science-based information. And the reason why is that it, it informs agencies, managers, and policymakers. We need to inform them about this information. Going back to D.C. and talking to numerous members of Congress, a lot of folks were unaware that this was occurring on their public lands and at this extent. We still have a job before us to inform these individuals, but also it's the education of the public because a lot of the public feels that it's just a mom and pop situation, outdoor cultivation, it's completely green, everything, nothing's wrong with it, and they're not realizing that this is their public lands and their public resources being utilized without their, public, uh, with their, without their permission. And in addition to that, 
is that everybody lives downstream. So all this contamination that's occurred in regards to potential water sources and wildlife, the public needs to be aware of this to see if they're content with what's going on. And then also supporting mechanisms, um, I mean mechanisms of support. Um, it's starting to occur now, uh, but in the beginning, a lot of folks were thinking that uh, what we were endeavoring on was a morality and ethical issue. It was not an environmental issue. And that's the, that's the scope that we need to change, uh, the mannerism we need to change with folks, is that this is actually an environmental issue. And California fits in second in, a re, in regards to the number of endangered species within our nation behind Hawaii. We have, we have just a, such a unique bioregion here, and a lot of this cultivation occurs from sea level to 6,000 feet. So, you know, I, I feel that, the, you know, doing this information and educational processes to the public as well is, is keen essential to say that their natural resources are at risk if we continue down this road. So finally, not to, um, I like to end with a quote from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And I think this quote is, uh, fits it perfect because, again, it's give, it heeds back to the information and, um, and education process where the public must decide whether it wishes to continue on the present road and it can only do so when fully possession of the facts. And I think we're not in full possession of the facts right now. And what I mean by that is we're just barely scratching the surface. What I've presented is a collaboration effort with only two years of data. This has been going on for several years before, and in current pace, it's going to continue going on. And therefore, we can't, well, what I run, what I fear is that, um, the risks are going to continue, and we, ha we haven't created the documentation because what I don't want to see is 30 years down the road a population decline or bioaccumulation from various toxicants out there, and we haven't collected that potential puzzle pieces, which could be this particular factor and this variable contributing to that. So with that, I know this is a very uplifting talk. Um, if I have time for questions, but I, um, but again, you know, one of the things I like to state is, uh, unlike a stochastic event, like a wildfire started by a lightning strike, we can't control that. That's lightning, that's weather, that's going to happen. But we'll, we can control and we can address this issue. This is a human anthropogenic influence variable. And as humans, we've always been able to overcome issues that are far greater than this. So, I, you know, kind of back to that slide, there's always light at the end of that path. And I, I think we see the light, so we need to continue forward on it.